Hello there my adventurer friends. Today we'll be going over a group of people who are essential for normality in the great city of Credania. A people whose very existence keeps the city in a delicate balance of the whims of the mortal men who live there and the eternal owners of the Twelves Wood, the elements. As you've likely guessed, and totally didn't know because of the video title. Today, we'll be looking at the Pajal. Now, the Pajali are a fascinating people and race. A race which appears to be all children. Their aging completely stopped at roughly the age of 10. But they are actually extremely long-lived, reaching well over 200 years. One recorded to have lived till the age of 272. However, they are not a race at all, but rather much more accurately described as a subspecies of the Midlander here. They are relatively new in that they did not exist before the Sixth Astral Era, the very first Pajal appearing a mere 500 years ago. Yet even so, they have made their mark on history, especially the history of the great city-state of Gradania, whose very existence heavily relies on the Pajal and their ability to communicate with the city's hosts, the true owners of the Twelves Wood, the Elements. But uh, let me tell you the story of the first Pajal, and how their people came to be. And in order to do this, we must first go back before the existence of Gradania and look upon a very specific Midlander who lived in the city-state of Gelmora, the great mage, Yorin Lightheart. It was he who succeeded in communing with the elements in year 1076 a feat that the Great Mages has been trying for 50 years. Now, it must be noted that all the Mages who attempted to do this were Midlander here, and Yorin Lightheart's circle of Mages that assisted him in communing with the elements were all Midlanders too. It is for this reason that it is hypothesized why Pajal can only be born of Midlander families. Now, I do have a few parchments here that tell of Yorin Lightheart's first meeting with the elements, though all of them are unverified by scholars. Many believe them to be fabrications by bards and minstrels to make the event seem far more fantastical than it actually was. One account states that when Yorin Lightheart emerged from the Galmoran entrance, the forest in an instant grew still. All the monsters and animals carefully watched the mages as they walked towards the Peace Garden. This is where the mages had always tried to commune with the elements. Another account here states that when they reached the Peace Garden, the winds stirred around them, and the mages felt as if the very trees of the forest had shifted closer to them, to listen intently to their words. As I have stated, unfortunately, none of these are verified, and we have no verified accounts of the events. Thus these must be regarded as fiction. What we do know is that when the elements finally broke their silence, they spoke directly to Yorin Lightheart. They granted him and the Galmorans their blessing to live in the Twelves Wood, on the condition that they would defend the forest. Lightheart agreed to this term, and suddenly a bright light shone forth. The elements declared it a sign of their pact and a gift to the people who would live in their forest. The light approached Yorin Lightheart and entered his body, humorously going to his heart. Light. Heart. Uh, I'm sorry. The light vanished and all was silent once more. 
your and Lightheart, feeling no different, would return to Gelmora with the mages and convince the populace to move above ground to establish the city of Gridania. That's an interesting story in how Gridania came to be, I see you thinking. But how is all this important to the Pajal? Well, my friend and listener, that covenant was what caused the first Pajal to come to be. For it was in year 1081, Joran's wife bore him a son, he who grew into the first Pajal. This boy was born with small bumps on his head, and three years later, in 1084, the bumps had grown into clear and visible horns. At the same time, the boy had started predicting events that would occur in the Twelves Wood. He correctly predicted the exact time a great rainstorm would hit the forest. Another is that he warned the city of a blight that would occur in their apple orchards. He was heralded as a child of the gods by the people. But Joran knew otherwise, thinking back upon the light the elements had blessed him with. Years later, in 1093, it was noticed that the boy had stopped aging. Fearing some unknown disease, Joran told the boy he would have the city's best healers look over him. But the boy stopped his father, declaring, Father, I am not sick. It is a sign the elements have chosen me to be the mediators between the forest spirits and man. My name is Eohak Pota, the sound the etheric waves make when the elements speak to me. Upon hearing this, Joran knew his hunch to be correct. His firstborn son was the element's blessing made manifest. It is thus that the Lightheart lineage ended, as Joran Lightheart became Joran Porta, his family renaming themselves in honor of his firstborn son. Now, why did I tell you all this? Well, it is because all the actions taken by Eoak Porta are still practiced by the Pajal today. In the year 1117, another Midlander here family bore a son with the telltale signs of horns. Upon hearing this, Eoak Porta immediately went to the family and offered to take the child into his care. At this time, Eohak Porta was considered the sole voice of the elements. Thus, the family was honored their son would be raised by him and surrendered him over. Eohak Porta gave the boy a name, Yukote Num. It was the sound the etheric waves made when the elements referred to the boy. Fun fact! This is also when Eoak Porta referred to himself and the boy as Pajal, and henceforth the horned children of the forest had their collective name. Today, when a child in Gridania displays the telltale signs of being a Pajal, that is, they start to develop horns, the parents near immediately seek out the conjurers of the still grow fane in order to surrender their child to them. It is at or near this time the eldest Pajal in the Fane would give the child a new name, their Pajali name. If this is the first time the family had born a Pajal, the child would also be given a new surname. The Pajal's Hurian family, upon hearing their child's new surname, would nearly always rename themselves to match their Pajali child's name. For bearing a Pajal in one's family is seen as a great honor and a mark of pride in Gridania. However, on a very rare occasion, a family may not wish to surrender their child, as I can only imagine how immensely difficult it is to do so. Unfortunately for them, it is by Gridanian law that the Stillgrove Fane may still claim the child and take them in any means they need to, though this is, thankfully, nearly never required. You may think, that's monstrous, how could you demand and force a mother to separate unwillingly from her child? And yes, I would agree, it 
does appear heartless, but it is actually for the safety of the city, the family, and the child. For you see, a Pajal, naturally, is immensely etherically powerful and has great etheric gifts. If they are not properly trained to control these gifts, they act like beacons for Void Scent. Void Scent who would quite happily and excitedly consume the Pajal for the massive bounty of Aether inside them, killing all who would stand in their way. It is also by Gradanian lore, perhaps due to the rarity of their existence and their importance in keeping the elements happy, Pajal may not leave the Twelve's Wood unless circumstances deem it necessary in the protection of said Twelve's Wood. Of the Pajal living today, only two have ever left the Twelve's Wood. Khan E. Senna, as head of the state, leaves many times to visit other city-states, as well as to fight with her troops on the front lines of battle. And, uh, White Mage story spoilers, her brother, Arun Senna, who left the Twelve's Wood as he was inspired by the spirit of another Pajal, and emulates that spirit today by protecting the forest from the outside, writing a fearic corruption before they reach the Twelve's Wood. Fun fact, Pajal refer to each other as sister or brother, regardless of their blood connection. This is part of their indoctrination in the Stillglade Fane. It is seen as a way to display their connection. They are all connected as a family through the elements and their service to the Twelve's Wood. Speaking of Gradanian laws, let's talk about who makes them. The government. The reason we're going to talk about the Gradanian government is that it is actually very important to the Pajal. Today, the entire leadership of Gradania is run by the elder seed seer, Khan E. Senna, though historically it was run by the seed seer council, which is headed by the elder seed seer. In year 1123, E. Ohak Porta was summoned by the seed seer council. The then rulers of Gradania were comprised of the best healers the city had and those who could best hear the elements. They offered him the official leadership of Gradania and the new title, Elder Seedseer, and to become officially the de facto leader of Gradania. Just for fun, the Gradanian government worked as thus. The council would meticulously debate and vote on things. This occurred in the Lotus Stand, an outside area with no roof. This is for the benefit of the elements, so they could watch over the proceedings. Now, interestingly, even though all matters were put to vote, the results would always reflect the will of the elements. Even if the seed seers themselves didn't strongly agree with the outcome, it is as the city's motto, Wood's will be done. Now, this all changed with the seventh umbral calamity that occurred roughly five years ago, along with the rising danger and challenge of the Galian Empire. They agreed they could not afford time to debate. Thus, the council voted unanimously that Elder Seedseer Khan E. Senna would rule over all matters of state and law until such a time as the danger has passed. And thus, the current ruling government came to be, with Khan E. Senna having absolute power. Now, a bit about their etheric power. The Pajal are trained to control this through Conjury and the full power of white magic. And only Pajal can be white mages. Pajal are the only people sanctioned by the elements in the use of white magic. What? I've seen so many white mages in my adventuring parties, I hear you say. Well, fun fact, no. No, you have not. All these guys are actually just really good conjurers, according to the law. 
way back in the sixth umbral calamity and roughly 1100 years before the Pajal came to be, the use of magic was banned, especially the use of white magic and black magic. As the Great Flood, that is, the Calamity, was caused by the use of these two schools of magic. Now, we won't go over it here, but if you're interested, I could talk about the War of the Magi some other time. But here, all you need to know is that after the Calamity, the elements hid away after 4 and the secrets of white magic. The elements are beings made of naught but Aether, and they perceived the Aether draining nature of white magic as a direct threat to their very existence, and want to prevent it from re-entering the world outside of their control. Thus, they would only grant the knowledge to the Pajal to use it. The Warrior of Light, if they choose to train as a conjurer, will become a white mage since they are gifted a soul stone that once belonged to a Pajal. So, at least in the eyes of the elements, they are, well, Pajal. Now, with the history, government importance, Pajali law out of the way, let's actually go ahead and talk about a few of the Pajal. Knowing the weight they bear as leaders, teachers, guys and guardians of an entire city, as well as the sole bearers of a powerful form of magic, is a great burden. And perhaps all of this would cause one to perceive them as something more supernatural than just another race of people. So I am to dispel that notion. The Pajal have wants, desires and quirks just as anyone else. I actually have a letter from Seed Seer Rhea or Senna. I asked her to help me show that the Pajal are just like anyone else. So let's see. Ah. She wrote of her siblings and of herself it seems. The eldest of age, 28. Kani Senna. She loves the taste of Moon Tay Brew. For those of you who have not stayed long in Gradania, it is a strong alcoholic beverage that is drank quite commonly in taverns here. She is also known to be surprisingly adept at the many dances of Mughal kind. It seems that Kani Senna, when she can, enjoys to party and let loose. A Rune Senna has a staff with a strange face on it. It rattles and makes goofy faces when magic courses through it. With him now being 18 summers old, he thinks it's a childish thing to enjoy it. But secretly, he still loves it and can actually be seen using it as his white mage staff. And finally, Rhea or Senna. She feels the burdens of being a seed seer would affect her love life. Apparently, she's worried she may never find love and will never be wed. I feel like she should be more worried that she looks like and will always look like a 10 year old. But she is 21, so. you know. FBI, open up! <laughs> Now let's look at the Pajali language and how their names are formed. The Pajali language, or at least the names the Pajal take, are the sounds of etheric waves they hear when the elements speak to them. Both their first names and their last are these waves. Unfortunately, it seems like the Pajal know this language instinctually and there isn't much knowledge of how it works to those who are not of Pajal descent. From what we do know, Pajali names are comprised of three words, the first two words being their first name, with the last section being their surname. The first name is comprised of two sections. One is always a simple vowel sound, A, E, I, O, or U. The other is some word or sound in Pajal, 
it is unfortunately unknown to us if this has any meaning beyond the name. For male Pajal, the vowel sound is always first. O ap pesi, i sumiyan, i ohak pota. For female Pajal, the vowel sound is always second. Kan i sena, rea o sena. In Pajali, when a series of words in a sentence is talking of a single concept, such as a proper noun, a certain object, place, etc., the words are hyphenated together. This is why all Pajali names look the way they do. When Pajal words are talking about different objects, they are separated by spaces, displaying that each of them are distinct. So for a bit of fun, there are numerous areas on the adventurer's map that we can explore that has Pajali names. For example, there's Etat Spire, a watchtower in the North Shroud. This is named after a historical Gradanian hero, Etat Rai, a Pajal who made great contributions to the advancement of Conjury. And then there's Hawk Manor. This one has a great history. It used to be owned by the Seed Seers. Well, not the current one. It was sold off three Elder Seed Seers ago by that Elder Seed Seer. He was a bit of a revolutionist and agreed with the citizenry. The citizens of Gradania argued it was wrong for the Pajal to live in such extravagance and saw the manor as a symbol of excess. The Elder Seed Seer who owned it scoffed at this notion declaring it was merely a place for spiritual reflection and meditation. Right, no corruption here. Unfortunately, when the Pajal did sell it, they sold it to Lady Amandine, who had some pretty bad things happen there. Now, let's see. That's their history, their culture, their importance to Gradania, their naming, and their language. And that's it for Pajal and all we know about them. I see you're still here though. Well, since you're still here, you can help me with something. I've been trying to figure out what lore people would like to see next. So I can either speak of the faiths, that is the religions, of the races of men, or perhaps I can finally go over the lore of the dragons. Please let me know what you'd rather see first. But for now, goodbye my friends, and have a great day.